SNCC grew out of the sit-in movement that began at the Woolworth lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina uh, in February 1960. Uh, these sort of increased rapidly, expanding across the state and across the eastern seaboard. Um, and within a couple of months, SNCC would sort of establish itself uh, as a civil rights organization led primarily uh, by young people, but advised by sort of a veteran civil rights activist, Ella Baker, right, who's trying to kind of capitalize on a wave of protests. Now, SNCC initially um, sort of adhered to the philosophy of nonviolence, right? It was initially dedicated to kind of Christian principles, uh, influenced by um, uh, leaders like James Lawson, who uh, had been a theological student. Um, he had studied Gandhian nonviolence, right? Um, and he sort of insisted on uh, sort of nonviolence, right? Nonviolent direct action as the basis of SNCC's activity. So um, it was initially very dedicated to Christian principles, but tension sort of existed early on between religious and secular activists uh, in SNCC, right? Um, even after the conference in Raleigh in 1960 that established SNCC, many people began to move away from Lawson uh, and the late John Lewis's kind of Christian radicalism. Um, and in 1961, tensions would rise even higher as members debated whether to focus on nonviolent direct action or engage in activities such as voter uh, registration drives, right? Um, now, the break from institutional religion uh, would really um, kind of manifest itself uh, in the life and career of James Foreman, who uh, would become the executive director of SNCC um, in 1961 and would serve in that role until 1966. Um, so he wasn't exactly the top leader. That was the chairman and John Lewis was the chairman uh, until Stokely Carmichael took over and won the election in 1966. But Foreman really ran kind of the day-to-day -day operations of the organization. Uh, during that five year period from 61 to 66. And um, Foreman's political ideology, unlike that of Lawson and John Lewis, was not grounded in Christian theology, but rather in secular humanism, right? Foreman had begun to move away from uh, religion as a young man. He had some negative experiences. Um, attending a Catholic school uh, in the mid-1930s. He uh, experienced discrimination there um, because of his race. Um, he also had some negative experiences in um, evangelical Black churches uh, during his youth, right? So um, when he was 12, 13 years old, he would go down and visit his grandmother in uh, Concord, Mississippi, um, and really just couldn't get with this sort of fire and brimstone preaching um, at the Concord Baptist Church that his grandmother attended. Um, and in fact, he relates in um, his own autobiography, The Making of Black Revolutionaries, he, he relates a scene that's very similar to one that you see in the writings of a number of Black freethinkers, namely uh, a moment that's supposed to be his kind of conversion to Christianity, but actually becomes the sort of beginning of his path uh, towards atheism and towards free thought, right? So um, he's, he's sitting on the mourner's bench, right, up at the front of the church. Uh, there's, you know, it's a revival service. There's basically a lot of pressure um, on everybody on the mourner's bench to convert. So the mourner's bench is basically filled with uh, people who haven't yet accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, right? Um, and in Black churches, you're not getting off of that mourner's bench until you're either converted or until you say that you're converted. Right. Um, so he's up on there and he says the older people shouted that they had got religion. He says at the age of 12 in a Baptist tradition and setting, I did not have the courage to tell my grandmother that I thought this was all nonsense. I simply observed what had been happening around me and knew that I too could fabricate some tears in this emotionally charged atmosphere. So I covered my face with my handkerchief and cried, Lord, have mercy. 
it worked. I was taken off the mourner's bench and people talked of how many children got saved that day by the grace of the Lord. Uh, we see this same scene. It's kind of funny, but we see this repeated in uh, the work of Langston Hughes, uh, kind of Zora Neale Hurston's autobiography. She doesn't have a scene on the mourner's bench, but sort of a similar experience. Um, James Baldwin as well, and uh, Richard Wright. So this kind of happens again and again. Um, so he already knew around 12 that he didn't believe in the sort of theological ideas being espoused in his church. And his development towards atheism and secular humanism would continue in college, right? At Wilson Junior College uh, in Chicago in the late 1940s. Um, and then later, uh, when he's doing a second stint at Roosevelt College um, in Chicago, again, taking a philosophy course, he had to write um, a final paper uh, for his philosophy of religion course and said that God finally died in my conscious mind as he was sort of doing the research uh, for that paper. He said, the most important things I've learned from this class are a number of intellectual arguments which disprove the myth that there is a God. And Foreman wasn't just uh, in somebody who happened to be an atheist. You know, he wasn't a political figure who happened to be an atheist. He was a political figure who was very much influenced by his atheism. And he felt that his atheism kind of called him uh, to be active politically. Um, and, and he also felt kind of conversely that atheism, that um, belief in God was a major factor keeping African Americans in a subordinate position in the United States, right? He looked around and uh, from his perspective, he saw um, a lot of kind of otherworldliness to black religion. And he thought that um, black religion uh, promoted sort of disenchantment from the realm of politics. He thought that it was something that was actually hurting African Americans because it was causing them to sort of uh, look towards God uh, for help rather than doing the work and kind of organizing themselves uh, here on earth, right? Um, so he began to be politically engaged uh, while he was uh, in college. Uh, and then, like I said, later on would become um, very much sort of involved in uh, and le a leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, one of the sort of big four uh, civil rights organizations uh, as of 1960. Um, now, along with uh, James Foreman, Stokely Carmichael was another kind of key free thinker um, of the civil rights movement. Um, and both of them together were some of the earliest supporters of black power um, kind of as a political ideology and as a political movement. Um, now, black power is something that would sort of grow out of um, the traditional civil rights movement, but would also kind of challenge um, that movement in that, you know, Foreman as a, as a leader of SNCC, uh, was part of this classical civil rights movement, but would sort of help to inaugurate a transition to black power um, and to this broader um, black power movement. Um, now I mentioned Stokely Carmichael as another figure who uh, was a kind of leading uh, intellectual articulating uh, the philosophy of black power. Um, Carmichael was, uh, he had grown up in the West Indies uh, for the first 10 years of his life. Uh, then lived in the Bronx, um, where he, uh, as a teenager, attended uh, the Bronx High School of Science. Um, and so for him, uh, kind of in a similar fashion to Foreman, um, studying uh, science, studying philosophy would also lead him um, to sort of uh, be able to articulate um, opposition to ideas of God and traditional Christian theology, right? Um, uh, Stokely Carmichael would attend Howard University uh, for a short period before also becoming involved with SNCC uh, in the early 1960s, uh, participating in voter registration drives uh, and the like. Um, and together in the mid 1960s, Foreman and Carmichael would help to sort of articulate what black power was. Um, this is a movement that began in 1966 
um, as a way to sort of politically uh, and economically uplift uh, black communities, right?